What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. And welcome. You guys have made it back to the campfire for a new episode. And we have a special episode for you today. It's an inaugural episode of a sorts. Hey, Bryce. Hello. What news do you have for us today? What updates? Um, yes. Yeah? Yes. So... I, this is not true crime related, but you guys, I'm, I am still devastated that Matthew Perry has passed away. Yeah. I, I want to watch Friends, but I don't want to watch Friends. No, I can't even watch like the, like, um. Oh, I haven't introduced you yet. No, yeah. you haven't. So I don't know why I'm speaking. I don't My bad. Know. Yeah. Everybody, Olivia is with us for this episode. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Sorry. It's fine. I didn't know if I should stay stay quiet or not. So yeah, you weren't you weren't directed to talk. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, it's fine. We also have uh, two podcast puppies with us now. Now you all you know who's in the room. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. There there is nobody else in this room. <laughs> so let's hope. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I'm very sad. It's very very hard. I had, still have not told Haley. Oh my god! I don't know how don't to say it. Think you should. To I don't be honest. think I can. Honestly, she'd be devastated. Yeah, yeah. Thank God she she's kind mm. of oblivious to things. She wouldn't. She'd be like, mm. oh well. I don't think so. I I just I am traumatized from when she watched the end of Titanic, and and Jack died. And oh my god. Well, even I, when like Cameron Boyce passed away, yeah, that was really that hard was for her. Really hard for her. Yeah, uh, for those who don't know, Cameron Boyce is a Disney star. Like he was a Disney kid. He was pretty popular, and he he passed away a few years ago. And that was like one of Haley's favorite actors. But that's horror. It's I just I don't want to I don't want to be in a world where there's like people are that's from, the thing. Betty shows White, that I like to watch are are passing away. When Betty White died, I stopped. I mean, it like, was the beginning of the it, year. Just exactly set the tone. like yeah, I stopped living. That was it. Yeah, I knew this year was going to be absolute dog shit. Yeah, yeah. We still have Dolly Parton though. We have Dolly. Yeah, but even um, with Celine Dion, she's got some health problems going on right now. I, has has she not had like health problems for like twenty years or something? I mean, she though? has, but like it's getting to the point where she's not even performing anymore. Oh, like okay. she's had to cancel. Okay, shows. well, she was just in that movie. Did you watch that movie on Netflix with uh, Nick Jonas's wife? No, it's actually pretty cute. You should watch it. Um, your dad's not interested, but it's it is <laughs> a cute movie. It's it's like a rom com. It's it's a cute movie. Um, no, that was Celine Dion was one of the. Songs I played to break the ice with Vanessa. Yes, yes. <laughs> we went on a long road trip, and uh, I was like, "Oh, we'll play some family music." No, I I required Dion. driving music, and so your dad challenged me to sing songs. So he played C- Celine Dion. He played Whitney Houston, mm. all the greats, all the classics. Yes, that all you know were belting, belting and. I rose to the occasion. I'm sorry, right? but we're a really cultured fucking family. The fact that my dad just said belting <laughs> as a choir term. Yeah. Oh, come on. He knows. All I'm saying is some some dads, they don't know what that means. Mm, it's Uncultured swine. <laughs> I, <laughs> I had two choir kids. <laughs> I had done lots of bingo. Nobody to, uh, understands what the reference is. Oh. <laughs> In California, you could do bingo to pay for school activities, and so yeah, yeah that you was can a volunteer. You can volunteer and you make some time, make money while you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Poor dad. Oh, he That's loved funny. it. <laughs> Your he, mom, not so much. N- <laughs> no, because they're rude. 
I like playing bingo. Yeah, you like playing. Yeah. Hey, I won a lot of money. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and but, believe it or not, I was a uh, I was a bingo caller. Yeah. <laughs> what? I think th- I think it's a missed opportunity, honey. I think you had a calling in life that you've ignored. Yeah. Yeah. No, I did it. You fully blossomed at that bingo call. That's how my daughter got to go to Ireland. Oh, yes. Bingo yeah. paid for those trips for her choir trips. Yeah. I need to I need to go back to Ireland and I need to somehow get Hosier to fall in love with me so he can write a song about me. A whole album about your your love and breakup. Yes. Yeah. Goals, mm-hmm. life goals. Yeah. That's how Mara got to Disney World. Yeah. Yeah. I got to Ireland. She got Disney World. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Any any updates, Bryce? Um, still UK in the lead outside, but still in the United States, it's still very, very fascinating. Yeah, why is that? Um, let me see. Bring it back up. The number two in the United States. Guesses. Connecticut. Mm, I don't know. Florida. Tejas. Who? Texas. Oh, oh, oh. Hello, oh. Texas. That's probably your sister. Not, no. No? Unless she's downloading over 200 times. Oh, I don't know. Mm-mm. I don't know. Okay. No, there, Hi, not, Texas. It's not in Dallas, Fort Worth. Oh, okay. It's all over. Hmm. Huh. Well, hello. Well, welcome to the campfire, Texas. Hello. Hello. All right. Well, this episode is coming right before Thanksgiving. So we want to, you know, take the time to wish everybody a happy, you know, day with your family and, and really try to kick off the holiday season with, you know, remembering what's important. So, of course, family is important. And, I always encourage people to help others when they're in need. And this year, you know, is hitting people harder than most. So I I just encourage everybody, you know, don't just keep walking past people who are in need and, and you see and it's a nuisance or you're annoyed or you're scared or whatever. They're they're going through shit. Everybody's going through shit. So I not to be Debbie Downer or anything, but I I always feel like this is the time of season when we should kind of reflect on that. And I think talking about true crime really brings that to maybe even another level. Like, you know, we talk about people who have lost loved ones and um, the holidays aren't the same for them anymore. You know, when, when your family is, is broken like that. So I just, you know, be thankful for what you have. I guess is what I'm trying to say and, yeah. and, and do good where you can do good. And, and hopefully, you know, the holidays treat you well. And we definitely um, are thankful for each and every one of you guys and thankful for the um, Patreon members that we have. We have um, a few people who have joined. So thank you for that support. We really appreciate it. And yeah, um- on the piggyback of that, like I remember my dad because he was an NCO and he, my dad was in the Air Force for 23 years. And of course, Veterans Day and then Thanksgiving, my dad would always um, bring home uh, airmen that were mm-hmm. new to the Air Force or new to the base. And they would spend Thanksgiving with us. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, similar kind of thing because my grandfather would, I, we always had extra people at the table and. That was one of the things that I, it never failed to shock me or I I guess just uh, I was in awe of him being able to strike uh, strike up a conversation with somebody on the street Mm -hmm. and see if they had a place to go for the holidays or did they have a place to go for a hot meal and, and, you know, there were many times when we had homeless people that my grandfather just brought in from off the street to come and have a meal with us on, on any given day could yeah. happen. So it's, I think that 
you know, those are the things that people are not willing to do anymore because you just don't know yeah. what you're letting in your house. But especially it, our audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not saying we're the most skeptical go, of them all. I'm not saying that, but yeah. there are avenues that you can yeah. you know get if get not, involved yeah. in Maybe if you you're interested in that. Donate a turkey. Yeah, you know. something like that. There there's well, just always good things to do. Yeah. yeah. This yeah, like Jess said, the economy's hitting harder for more people than you know, and if you have it, do what you can. Do what you can. Yeah. Yeah. I try and I have lost a couple of umbrellas because I've handed them out to like people who have had broken umbrellas standing in the pouring rain here in Washington. Yeah. It never rains and, here. Oh, <laughs> I'm done with you. Never. <laughs> never. No. No. But yeah, I've I've given away a couple blankets, a couple umbrellas just just to help when I can. Yeah, because winters are getting colder and summers are getting hotter. Yeah, it's crazy, crazy times. We live in a mad world, <laughs> God, and, dude. and we're about to talk about a story that doesn't um, is not going to give you the feels. I guess no. <laughs> we could say. Anyway, but, but happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, happy yeah. Thanksgiving, guys. I don't know where I was going with that. That was that was. Help but when you can. We, I wanted to say I appreciate everybody that's listening and, you know, spread spread the love. So yeah. happy Thanksgiving. And also kind of to, to speak, I was also going to mention happy um, Veterans Day. Happy Veterans yeah. Day. Thank and you. I yeah, don't thank know why I thought of Hanukkah. Hanukkah's coming. It's not even Hanukkah it's not season Hanukkah yet. yet. No. December 7th, I think. Pearl Harbor Day. Yeah. I think it's Seriously? December seventh. Yeah, that's early. I think so. Mm. Um, I could be wrong. I could be very wrong, but I I think so. Um, but yes, thank you for everybody for your service. If you are a veteran, it is it is not something I could ever do. So I definitely appreciate. I think Thanksgiving is just or November is the season of Thanksgiving. So thank you. All right. So the reason Olivia is here, no. <laughs> Is she actually has a case to share with us, guys. So I'm going to turn it over to Olivia. I'm here for moral support, honey. It's oh, all right. You're thanks. okay. You're doing great, sweetie. You're doing good, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> That's my girl. <sighs> no, Olivia's got a case to tell us that uh, is going to be it's going to be a long one. So buckle in. Yes, definitely. Get your uh, what is it that Beth and Christy always say? From Crimes and Closets. Hold on to your pants. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on to your pants. <laughs> hold on to your pants. Hold on to your pants. All right. Take it away. Okay. So first I'm going to put out a little disclaimer because throughout, I don't really necessarily say which one I get the information from. Um, so I kind of just want to put a disclaimer that yes, for this case, there is a cold case files episode but I am mostly going off like the court documents and a couple of other articles that I have found. I will do my best to try and like tell you what came from where, but just so you guys have an idea. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So I'm going to take you back to Christmas time of 1985. Oh, the holidays. Yes. And to be exact, we're going to December 19th. Of 18, or 1985, my bad. We're not going that far. Old-timey crime. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, we're going to be going to a little town here in Washington called Chehalis. That is a tongue twister for me. Around this time, Chehalis was mostly used for logging and railroads and had a population of about 6,000 people. Wow, that's really small. Yeah. But today, specifically, we will be talking about the case of Edward Murren, or Ed, and Wilhelmina Mary Murren, or Minnie. Ed was 81 and Minnie was 83. They were both well-known in the community of Lewis County. If you asked around, they were commonly known as everyone's grandparents, essentially. They owned a 120-acre Christmas tree farm, helped people in their community who needed jobs, and were well established in their church. So just six days before Christmas, Ed and Minnie were hosting their annual Christmas dinner potluck for the couples of their church, like they did every year. 
And when people started to show, they anxiously waited for the couple to open the door. But after a few minutes of waiting, they realized both the couple and their car were gone. And a few people noticed that it is unusual for the couple to not be on the property when they had events planned. So one of the church members knew Ed and Minnie's daughter-in-law, Shirley. She called up Shirley and told her what was happening. And Shirley knew, obviously, how out of the ordinary this was, decided to drive down and check it out. When Shirley arrived, the door was locked, guests were gone, and the couple's car missing. Concerned, Shirley didn't call police yet, but instead called family members or neighbors to see if anyone knew what was going on. And when she couldn't get an answer, she decided to unlock the door and enter the house. She noticed big statements scattered all over the living room and bathroom, Minnie's purse behind the couch with a newspaper covering it, and Ed's watch on his nightstand. Obviously, these things surely knew were out of the ordinary. And then she decided to call Lewis County Police and immediate family to come to the farm. When police did their walkthrough, they noticed there was no sign of forced entry or violence in the home, just the scattered papers, a missing car, and two missing people. Police asked neighbors if they seen or heard anything. To the episode, they didn't really give out if neighbors said anything, but in the court documents, they have reported some said they heard unknown voices and they saw unfamiliar men in or around the property. A woman reported a car following her through the neighborhood's But suddenly, the car disappeared, and she didn't see the face. So what time in the, like, what time in the day were they supposed to have this potluck? Around 5, 6 p.m. Oh, so it was like an evening Mm -hmm. event? Yeah. I guess it it was... nobody had seen them that day? Mm Mm-mm. Oh, no. Yeah. And everyone, because they're very well known in the community, everyone knows where everyone is, essentially. Yeah. And so everyone was a little worried. Another neighbor saw a weird car in the driveway, but assumed everything was fine because there was no, he didn't hear anything of concern. But oddly enough, a truck driver saw two men around 8 or 9 a.m. walking near the Murrins with what looked like a rifle. But yes, but because it was covered... They just told police it was a three-foot object because they couldn't have been certain. But I think you Mm. could be certain. You would think so. A rifle Uh, kind of is hard to mistake. I mean, I wouldn't be able to name what kind of rifle it was, but... No. Yeah. Okay. And so with family also arriving on the property, police were able to ask questions right away. No one knew anything or heard from the couple except for Minnie's son, Dennis Hadler, and grandson, Mike Hadler. When they were on their way to Mike's job around 5.30 a.m., they recall seeing the Murrins' house lights and thinking it was odd due to the fact of how early it was. But they went on as usual, and police didn't want to make anyone worry too much, so they started it as a missing person slash kidnapping case. But it was about to take a turn for the worse. The next cold December morning, the police got a call from two women who were cutting through the Yardbird shopping mall, saying they saw a man get out of what looked like the Mern's car and run towards the wood woods with an item covered with a white cloth. They didn't name the two detectives, but they arrived on scene and they confirmed that it was the Mern's Green 1968 Chrysler. And of all three sources, this was so important to everyone. But it was so cold that there was still ice and uh, fog on the car. And for some reason, a detective did not want to put his handprints on there. So he blew hot air on the car. To do what? Just to look through in the car. I don't know why that was so important. He couldn't have put gloves on? I don't know. They didn't specify why, but they just said all three documents that I looked at, all three sources said he blew hot air. Okay. 
I don't, I don't know. know that that would be effective. Especially How with the cold ice. Was it? I don't know. It was very early in the morning. It was about like 7, 8 a.m. in the morning. And so it was still pretty cold in a December yeah, Washington. I mean, it can get to the 20s mm-hmm. if it's not snowing. Yeah. I, I don't. Okay. Especially in Chehalis. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did. I don't quite understand that i would think that an officer would have gloves that he would be able to you know open a car or at least like shove off some of the ice that was on the (laughs) take a towel or something i don't know it was just very important that he blew the hot air oh yeah i mean i i guess if you're trying not to disturb something because you don't know what you're looking at i i i guess sure yeah i don't know so he looked into the little hole that he made with his hot breath, mm-hmm. and he he was on the passenger side. He saw that the keys were still in the ignition, and the interior of the car was covered in blood, along with blood dripping out of the passenger side door. Detectives also found a man's hat, a white shoe, cracks in the speedometer on the driver's side. They thought it was possibly from a shotgun. They also found cigarette buds and a red blanket laid on top of the driver's seat. After collecting all the evidence they could find, there was no body, no weapon, and no fingerprints. With little to no hard evidence, police had nothing to go on. So as police were still trying to keep it a missing person slash kidnapping, even after finding their car, they started putting together search parties and people were given sections of the town to search and nothing was found until sadly four days later. A man was driving down a logging road and when he saw what looked like CPR dummies, he stopped. But when he got closer, he realized it was worse than he ever could imagine. There on the side of the road was a female body and a little further up was a male body hidden in the brush. It's never a CPR dummy. Never. It's never a mannequin. <laughs> I. It's never. No. It. I. People. I. I don't know. I don't know. Because when I read that, I was like, "Why is that your first thought? Is a CPR dummy?" I just. I, I just think on that a logging road. The people are optimistic. I. I guess. I. Yes, because you're right. You're right. It's. It's a. It's your mind trying to make a connection of what you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think they want to find a dead body. You know, no. and they're like, oh, that's that can't be a dead body. No, and you, your brain tries to associate with what's familiar. So if, I don't know what this gentleman's job was, but if he has seen a lot of CPR dummies, then... That might be it. Might have yeah. what his first thought is because you're you're familiar with that. Most people are not familiar with finding bodies yeah. on the side of a logging road. So I, I guess I get that. But it always it's not funny, but it's I don't know how else to say that. It's odd. It that is people, odd. That, that's their first thing is oh it's a mannequin or oh it's yeah it's never it's never. I don't know because even if it was freezing or whenever why how would a a body's skin look like would it be as cold and as white as they make it seem in like the the movies depends like the blood i think it depends yeah if if it's cold enough i think so but i do think the like i think the post-mortem i was actually just listening to a podcast with paul holes there are certain things that can happen if if it is cold enough, it can preserve. And yes, if there, if the blood drains a certain way, then yes, that area can look very white, very pale. Mm-hmm. But then it, it also depends upon where the bodies were, if they've always been out in cold or if they were inside and then went out into the cold. There's a lot of like things that can happen post mortem. A lot of factors. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I I think it is it can happen in certain factors. And yeah. if they were outside this entire time, then they probably would look very, very cold, pale, yeah. white. Yeah. That's what I was trying to like connect was why he thought it was a CPR dummy. I was like, well, maybe because it's been so cold that yeah. they were just completely whitened out. But 
obviously, he immediately calls 911. As one does. As one does. Then everyone's worst fear was confirmed. Both the bodies were identified as Ed and Minnie Marin. They were officially pronounced deceased to the public. And it was also known that Minnie died from a shot to the left shoulder and neck area. And Ed died from a shot, quote unquote, almost square in the back. Hmm. Police also noticed it looked like they were dragged to their spots. So this made police think that they were dead before they were placed in the ditch. Around the bodies, they also found bullet casings, a pair of glasses, a comb, frozen blood puddles, and dentures. A comb? Yeah. It was Ed's. Aww. Ed's comb. The only evidence found at the scene that was remotely useful was a bank statement found in Ed's pocket. With that, they found out Ed actually called the bank and went in the same morning they went missing. Police went to the bank to go question the bank teller that helped him that day. She told police Ed came or called around 10 a.m. that morning to make plans to withdraw $8,500. I'm sorry. This is a small community. Did this bank teller not recognize that? These people were being looked for that there was like, no, oh, not at the time. No, she -hmm. thought it was a normal thing. Well, I mean, but, but it gets crazier. It gets crazier though. Hold on. Okay. Sorry. So after he made plans to withdraw Mm $8,500 an hour later or so, he came to pick it up. The teller said that Ed told him. He was buying a car. But when the family was questioned about it, they had no idea what was happening and why he needed that much money. Mm -hmm. So after their little catch up conversation, the teller then went on to tell Ed that it would be a couple more minutes to get all the bills. And so Ed patiently went out and waited in his car. And when the money was ready, she went out to the Murren's car to hand him the money. But she got maybe 10 feet close to the car, and he immediately runs right up to her. Hmm. And she was not positive, but she did say that she noticed a human shadow in their back seat, along with the form of Minnie. But she wasn't sure, so she didn't say anything. You will see that becomes a... It's a theme. It's a theme. Okay. And with that, he grabbed the money and was on his way. He went all through town. Everyone reported that they saw him and Minnie and a random guy in the back seat going all through town. So when did people come forward with that information? Not until a lot later. So it's I I can't believe that this is not all over the news that, you know, like these elderly people who are prominent members of this community are missing, as mm-hmm. the police are saying. The family is probably devastated. It's mm-hmm. right before Christmas. This has to be all over the news, all over the community. Nobody came forward in the four days in between the incident of them not being at home and then their bodies being found. Nope. And saying they saw them. Mm-mm. No one said anything. The fuck is wrong with these people? Well. Okay. Police at this point have a theory. Okay. Either A, they were too afraid to say who it was, or B, they truly did not know who was in the back seat. Okay, but even just say I saw Ed driving in their car with Minnie. Here, here, most of and them here. did oh, when police okay. have asked them. Most of them. Well, yeah, but when police asked, but I'm just saying people didn't come forward. I'm just having no, a hard time. No, they did I guess. not come forward on their own. They wow. only came forward with some form of information when asked by the police. Okay, very helpful. So, with police being frustrated because no one was identifying the man, the mystery man in the back seat. They had no choice but to go back to the two women who saw the mystery man running away from the car in the Yardbird parking lot. 
The women described him as a man with dark, shaggy hair, dark eyes, small growth of a beard, and a mustache. He was... It's yeah. everybody. It's everybody. It's everybody. <laughs> he was wearing a stocking cap and a green army coat. Oh, okay. Well, that's something at least. But there again, that's everybody, I think. It, it was everybody at that point. Yeah. But with that description the women gave, the police had to... The police had a composite sketch drawn and printed, posted everywhere, took pictures of everyone who matched that description, and printed an 8 by 10 copy and made a photo lineup. But when witnesses were shown the pictures, no one could identify the man, and the media never called with any clues. Hmm. With no evidence, lack of forensic evidence, no trace of the murder weapon, and every lead being dismissed, the case went cold until four years later. But then, we'll get back to that later. Because now it's break time. Okay. All right. Welcome back from the break. We are about to discuss four years later in April of 1990. Okay. So what did they find four years later? Well, actually, a lot more than they did four years earlier. I would hope so. Yeah. Police actually got a call from the brother of Scott Coulter. He tells police he overheard his brother, Scott, bragging and laughing about committing the murders. Scott was reported to have said, oh, yeah, I got that bitch. I killed her grandparents and I got their savings, too. End quote. OK, so how is he connected? So he was actually one of the granddaughter's ex-husband. So he was a part of the family at some point. Oh, he also had a criminal history of violence, mm. drug addiction, drug dealing, and burglaries. Well, he sounds like a real keeper. Yeah, he's just stand lovely. Up, stand up kind of guy. Yeah, just <laughs> who I'd love for my grandchild to bring home. Exactly. Yeah. But sadly, when police got word of his involvement, they knew he wouldn't just talk to them. So they had to plan what they called... A Mr. Big Sting operation. Oh, Mr. Big Sting. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know all about that. From our Canadian friends. Ooh. So they made a, a meeting, and they met at the Tacoma Narrows International Airport, where detectives pretended to be a part of the mob looking to initiate Scott. The fact that people fall for this shit is just, I don't I know. understand. Okay. Just randomly, two guys are just like, you want to be a part of the mob? Yeah. The the mob doesn't, like, what do they call that? Recruit? Initiate? Recru um, well, they initiate, I'm sure. But recruit or no, what's what's that called? Spearhead? No. The fuck? Head, head hunt? Yeah, sure. Yeah, head hunt. <laughs> Spearhead? I don't know. Spearhead? Head I don't know. Broken the arrow! <laughs> The, the fucking mob's not going to knock on your door and be like, hey, use. Yeah. You want to join? They don't fucking do that. That's not how that works. No, but they got him. Okay. They trapped him in a car. So as they're trying to initiate him, the police slash the mob, they need Scott to confess something he had done that was so serious he wouldn't dare tell anyone. Mm -hmm. So... Obviously, Scott was a little hesitant and a little scared. So police tried to egg him on. And Scott, he got a little shy. He got a little scared. Mm. So police were trying to egg him on, saying, we heard you were part of a job in Chehalis area that killed two people. Are you our man? Lo and behold, Scott... Starts talking about murdering an elderly couple. Mm hmm Saying, I got him, took him to the car, took him to the yard bird center, and... <laughs> so, lo and behold, Scott t talks about murdering an elderly couple, saying, I got him in the car, took him to yard bird center, and I... <laughs> so he takes his hand, makes a fake... Pew pew, Justin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
when they asked what kind of gun mm-hmm. did Scott use, he said a twenty two. Mm-hmm. Police knew right then and there Scott didn't kill them, the Murrins. Because what actually killed him was a 12-gauge shotgun. Yeah. Why would he brag about that? Because he wants to get in with the mob. This is weird. <laughs> he wants no, but friends. He even he said friends. it before. Yeah, he was bragging to somebody about it, but I, I don't know why. Because he wasn't even the one who did it. Like, there's no credibility there. Yeah, but he's trying to get street cred. Yeah. I mean, think about it all. He's, he's been doing more s- crimes, but smaller crimes. Yeah. So. He wanted in with the big wanted, boys. Yeah. He wanted some street cred. Well, you blew your shot. Yeah. You, I mean. You did not Hamilton that shit, so. World to, like, word to the wise. That's what I'm trying to say. Word to the wise. Don't claim to have committed crimes that you didn't actually do because at some point you might actually end up in trouble for yeah. those crimes. I mean, people are convicted for crimes that they don't commit all the time. You really don't want to go to jail for shit that you didn't do. Especially, I'm just also, saying. like with with the people who actually do commit the crime, they want the credibility. They want the street cred. Yeah. So they'll come to you. They will find you. And do something about it. So that's why we just don't talk about things that didn't happen to us. I mean. We don't gossip. We shouldn't shouldn't have to say that, but. I mean, no, but. Whatever. But with that devastating turn of events, they had no choice but to look at evidence again. Mm. And when they started looking at what they found with the bodies and the car, they saw cigarette butts. And they realized the couple didn't smoke. They didn't realize this four years previous? No. I don't think they were working very hard when they first got the case. I Was it the state police or was it like the sheriff's department? Who was it? It was it? The, sh- the sheriff's department. They might not have been equipped. Either, to... I mean, it was 85. Yeah. I, their evidence and forensic evidence probably was not the best. No, and there just wasn't like a developmented, de- developmental like training program for forensic science, things like yeah. that in, in smaller communities. Especially in like the small town that we're talking about. Yeah. Like it was it, logging and railroads. Yeah, might they just might not have had the training. Yeah. You would think that that would come up like, oh, is this the brand of cigarettes that your grandparents or your parents used to smoke? I, I don't know. I should have been a detective in the 80s. You should have. I could have done it. I was five, but okay. <laughs> a five-year-old detective? I was, I was seven years old. I could have Doogie Howard that shit. Hell yeah. Mm. But when they finally realized that the elderly couple did not smoke, mm. they found out that Minnie's grandson, who we have previously mentioned, Mike Hadler, did smoke. Okay. And he did also have a pass of violence and drinking and was getting back into the bar fight scene because he was so devastated. Mm. But it wasn't enough to convict him. So they had nothing again because he he those... proved that they were not his brand. Oh, okay. They were not the ones that he smoked. He proved it. And they were like, oh, shit. I mean, would would he have like financially gained in any way would he what would have been the motive for him to kill his they grandparents? couldn't think of one he didn't need eighty five hundred dollars for some reason drugs no because he or... had a pretty good job okay what i don't mention in here is one part of the family they also have their own logging company oh okay. in which mike hadler did work at at the time mm-hmm. and so he was making pretty good money he mm-hmm. didn't need to kill people for money not eighty five hundred dollars. No. Yeah. So he he was doing okay. He was okay. still getting into bar fights, but he was doing somewhat okay. I mean, work out your emotional trauma. It's fine. I we guess. Have ways, but yeah. so he didn't really. There wouldn't have been any motive. No, no motive to at all. 
killed his grandparents. No, I think the only reason why they put two two and two together was because he smoked and mm-hmm. he also saw the house the same morning that they disappeared. He was it was him and his dad who were mm-hmm. the ones that said they saw the light but didn't think anything of it. Hmm. Okay. So sadly enough, another fourteen years passed. Mm-hmm. And we're in two thousand and four. And, you know, with fifteen plus years of a of a case, policemen and detectives either retire or they just quit or they find a new profession. Mm-hmm. And so it was given to a newly policeman, Bruce Kimsey. Kimsey is the only name that came up when you talked about like the policemen or the detectives of this case. Okay. The other ones, they either didn't provide their name or they didn't want to be a part of the story. So Kimsey is all that I have. But the hunt was back on. And Kimsey was determined to look through every piece of evidence. And he actually was pretty smart because even I wouldn't have thought of this. After going through the details slowly, making sure he didn't miss anything, he realized something very important to the case. If you didn't realize, the Marins grew up in the early 1900s, meaning they grew up and were young adults during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. During that time, it was very common to have more than one bank account at one more than one bank. And I even put a little history lesson in here. Uh, During the Great Depression, over 9000 banks failed Mm -hmm. and took seven million dollars with it. Mm hmm. So people put various amounts in multiple banks just in case the bank didn't survive in the economy or they, quote unquote, hid their money in the walls. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Furniture. I mean, you hear about that kind of stuff all the time. Floorboards. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. They started it. They made it famous. Because there was no trust. Yes. Uh, Rightly so. There was no trust in the banking system. And I don't know when the FDIC stuff started. It was well after the Great Depression. I couldn't give you a year. But even after that happened, they they were there was no trust whatsoever in the in the system. (laughs) So that's a good call, though. I don't know that I I wouldn't have picked that up just like on my own. I mean, I think nowadays I would probably think about that, but in the maybe 2000s, no, because credit unions maybe like in the late 90s started to become a very popular way of like a a better way of of keeping your money in in a banking institution. Mm -hmm. Credit unions weren't always a thing. Yeah. that, That everybody had access to. So I don't. I don't know that I would think about that in 2004. Yeah. I just know that me personally, I would not have thought about it. I would think about it now because there's online banking. There's so many different. I mean, I myself, I like there's multiple banks. There's, yeah. So you know. the Banking Act of 1933 created the FDIC and was signed by President Roosevelt on mm-hmm. June 16th, 1933. So, I mean, I, I knew it was like after the Great Depression, but it, it's pretty much a result of the great depression yeah was that part of the new deal that he signed maybe what like that the roosevelt's known for the the new deal that doesn't mention anything about the new deal okay it just says by all by almost any measure the fdic has been successful in maintaining public confidence in the banking system yeah 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 If y'all didn't know that, there's a little history lesson for you if you didn't pay attention. Mm. Just like me. So, with this information, Kimsey wondered why did Ed only go to one bank instead of the multiple he had? How many banks are in this small town? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know, because they didn't even give out, like, the bank, like, the initial bank name. Oh. So, I have no idea how many he had or... Who he originally went to. Interesting. But but didn't... I guess I'm confused again with the police work. Were there not bank statements strewn upon, uh, across the house? There was. My guess was they only found the most recent one and they went with that. Like mm. the, the people who 
would have or did kidnap them. They only found one. Mm. Okay. Because then comes, well, obviously it wasn't someone they were close with Mm -hmm. who kidnapped them. Because their closest family would know how they operate and Mm -hmm. what they would do. Right. So this took off immediate family and close friends. Mm. So he started looking at people who worked on the farm. Because these were the only other people that Mm -hmm. Ed and Minnie would be close to. Mm -hmm. Because they were basically recluse. Mm -hmm. And because they were about 80 years old, they weren't moving much. Sure. Sure. But Kimsley, Kimsey was brought up to another dead end. But he did manage to go a little bit farther and get the original photo lineup from 85. And he noticed that they were very hard to make out uh, facial structures because they were in black and white and they were copies of copies of copies. So you could not see uh, anything. No, I, yeah. The technology. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They described on the on the actual episode of they ha- they took a Polaroid and then they cut it out mm-hmm. and on they taped it to one blank sheet of paper and then put in like ten people mm-hmm. and then printed that multiple times. Okay. So it was literally copies of copies of copies. Mm. Uh, so with the 2004, you know, new technology and all of that, he was able to basically restore the original pictures mm-hmm. from the Polar- Polaroids. Okay. So he made up a secondary lineup of the same people in different order and in color this time. Okay. He called all the same witnesses from before, hoped for new answers but they were still not saying anything new. Mm, okay. Okay. This is where it gets kind of crazy. So bear with kind me. Kind of crazy? Kind of. Okay. It's kind of been a little bit of boring back and forth. Police have a have a idea of where to go and they end up going nowhere. But this is where it all starts getting a little spicy. Okay. So if you don't have your pants held on to. Hold, hold on to your time. pants. Okay. Okay, are you ready for the tea? Uh, Yes, spill the tea. Okay. Now I've mentioned Minnie. Obviously, I've mentioned her before. Mm. I've mentioned Minnie's grandson, Mike Hadler, a few times, but now it's his time to shine. Okay. So a little over a year later, in November of 2005, Mike was on his way up to Oregon for a hunting trip when he stopped for some gas in Vancouver, Washington. And then he noticed an old buddy from high school. Now, his name was not 100%. There were many different names that he had in all the sources. Okay. So we're just going to call him by his last name because that was what was consistent. Okay. So his name is Shriver. Okay. So Mike and Shriver were catching up, doing the, the whole conversation of, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. How's your life? And... That's when they found themselves talking about the Marin case, when all of a sudden Shriver was getting nervous, sweating, and was needing to get something off his chest. Mm -hmm. This is where it gets crazy. So he starts on the morning of Ed and Minnie when they go missing. Mm -hmm. On December 19th of 1985, Shriver and his mom were on Highway 12 when his car was merging when this car, when a random car was merging onto the highway and ended up in front of them. Both Shriver and his mom recognized the car as the Marin's green 1968 Chrysler. It was going way under the speed limit, so his mom just passed. When Shriver got a perfect look at who was in the back seat, Mm. it was not one, like everyone was saying, but two people. Okay. And this is where we get the name. Greg and Rick Reif. And the only way he knows them is because they all worked at Ed and Minnie's uh, Christmas tree farm. Okay, so he not only I positively identified identifies them. them, but knows them for sure. Mm-hmm. And he was living with this for 20 years. 
And why didn't he come forward with this information? Because not only did he see the Rife brothers, but they saw him. Oh, shit. And they recognized him. And, you know, well, it's how windows work, but... Yes. Shriver saw it was a problem for the brothers, and they made sure he was going to stay quiet. So the next day, one of the Rife brothers went to Shriver's house and threatened him, saying if you told anyone... It would be his family next, and they would be killed just like the Marines, one by one, without him knowing. Nobody knew they were dead yet, so he confessed also to murdering mm -hmm. them. He had so much information. How old was this guy? 17. At the time? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh. He was 17 and scared shitless. Oh, honey. And he took that threat so seriously that ever since that day, he's carried a gun on him. Oh, shit. Mm hmm. And he made it very, very like um, he made everyone aware that it was on him all the damn time in the episode because mm-hmm. they asked him, like, what would happen? Like, did you have defense? And mm-hmm. he was like, yeah, I have a gun in my drawer right now, five feet away from him. Wow. Yeah, he was not. He was not having it. OK, but he was still scared. Yeah. But anyway. Let's talk about the Rife brothers now. Okay, who are the Rife brothers? They were known criminals in the town. They were drug addicts. They were violent. They were robbers, child abusers, rapists, and killers. Well, they sound great. They were amazing. Okay. And how do they tie in? So everyone knew about the Rife brothers. They knew what they looked like, what they did with their lives, and how they chose to live. Mm Mm-hmm. And the brothers made it apparent for everyone to know them. And so now that police have had a idea of who it was, Mm -hmm. in 1992, Mm -hmm. it was made apparent that after the brothers moved to Alaska in 87, two years after the murders, Mm -hmm. they were interviewed by Alaskan state troopers. How did they tie in to the... How how were they from the community? Mm-hmm. They lived there. Okay, so they lived in the community, so they were they were well known. They were well known. Okay. Everyone knew them, and they knew everybody. So would Ed and Minnie have known these these two guys? Yes. Okay. They worked on the farm with with them. Oh, why did they hire them? There was no backstory as to why, mm. but they were known to give people who needed jobs. They were known to give them jobs. Okay. They they were very helpful people, and they took the brothers took advantage of it. Yeah, sounds like it. Okay. So, of course, everyone knew they were dangerous, and they never dared to cross them. So I was shocked to find out that they actually police actually questioned them in 1992. In that year, they also found out that they. Moved to Alaska in 87, two years after the murder. Mm -hmm. Rick Reif was actually the first and only willing interviewee. So with a warrant and the help of the Alaskan state troopers, they went up there and they interviewed him. So who did? Who? The the um, sheriff? One of the old detectives that did not have a name. Okay. So in 1992, Mm -hmm. and whoever was investigating at that time went up there. Under, like, specifically to interview them regarding this case? Mm -hmm. How did they get linked at that time to the case? They started suspecting them from the start, but they never said anything because they were so dangerous. So police suspected them, but never gave it out to the media or anything. And so they wanted to make somewhat sure that they had enough Mm -hmm. evidence to question them. Okay. So in 1992, Rick was interviewed and there was rumors that the brothers had a 12 gauge shotgun around the same time that the Murrins were murdered, which he does confirm, kind of. Okay. So he says that him and his brother bought the 12 gauge the summer of 84, the year before the murders. Mm -hmm. He also states that Greg, his brother, asked him to cut the barrel shorter. So he had it. He had the gun for a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. But when Greg got it back, he noticed that it was too short 
and now illegal for use. Okay, I'm sure that little detail would not bother people such as themselves, but sure. No, but he was very, very fixated on it was illegal. We didn't use it. Gotcha. Okay. So somehow it got to their mother's house and their mother had thrown it away in a lake. Okay. And that was the last of that. Apparently the mother didn't even tell the brothers that it was gone in a lake. Uh Uh-huh. Then how did they find out? Just hearsay. Hmm. That's quite a story. It is quite a story. Because it's a famous saying, I lost all my guns in a boating accident. Mm. Is Is it? It It is. I've never heard that. Okay. A boating accident and that's how it ends up in the bottom of the lake. Yeah. Yeah. True. Makes sense. So not only was there speculation about a 12 gauge, people have seen Rick and Greg in a army coat. Hmm. Rick goes on to say, I maybe have that. I don't know. I mean, it was the 80s. Everybody had a fucking army coat. He hmm. he just said, quote unquote, I'm not sure. Hmm. Okay. So Rick was the only willing one. And so he gave fingerprints, palm prints, and a hair sample. Okay. No biggie. With Greg, he was not so nice. Hmm. So they had to get warrants for his fingerprints and his hair sample. Mm -hmm. When questioned, he initially denied any involvement. But when asked again, he said, and I quote, I don't know. I need time to think about it. End quote. (laughs) He, this man, starts crying in the interview and immediately stops it. And says, I'm not answering any more questions. He started crying? He started crying. Okay. That's an interesting turn of events. Especially when you're like, I need to think about it. You thought about it and then started crying. Yeah, you know you're about to be somebody's bitch in jail. That's why. (laughs) Exactly. I just found it very amusing that he started crying and then stopped the interview. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Obviously, it worked, though. It, it was, that was 92, and yeah. we're now in the 2000s. So. Okay. Now we're going to have to go back a little bit more. Just to the day of the murders. So. Do you remember when I talked about a woman who said someone was following her through the neighborhoods, and then suddenly the car disappeared? Yeah. When there was word of them possibly getting arrested, she later remembered that it was Rick Reif in the car following her. Exactly. So people didn't want to talk because it was them. Mm -hmm. Because it was these That's what made this so difficult. Because I I wanted to say right from the beginning. Yeah. And and that's unfortunate because I think that happens in a lot of small communities where crimes course, like this happens yeah. because it's very easy for people who are not afraid to be violent to threaten a large number of people mm-hmm. when it's a smaller like group. It's just easier yeah. because they know that they're so, they basically have no one to protect them. Right. Yeah. And especially because Rick and Greg were such known criminals in the community. Yeah. Everyone was scared shitless of them. Wow. That's very sad. And so in 2012, that's when she finally was like, okay, this is, this is who it was. And they, they drove off and disappeared right before going to the direction of Minnie's and Ed's. She just miraculously. She had a vision. She had a vision. Yeah. She had like um, a flashback and was like, right. oh, my God, this is the person. Yeah. Okay. And so now that they have a witness, an eyewitness, confirming that it was Rick Reif, mm-hmm. Kimsey in 2012 tried to get arrest warrants for both the brothers. Mm-hmm. But he found out that earlier that year, Greg Reif died of, quote-unquote, old age. How old were they? They were about 20 when it was 85. 
and now it's 2012, so they were probably about 40, 50. 2005, 40-something? Well, honestly, they were drug addicts in their younger lives. Yeah, I guess. And I couldn't find much history about, like, their childhood and, like, Mm -hmm. their, their high school years. And so I don't know if anything had happened then. Yeah. But yes, he died in so 2012. He just basically died of natural causes. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, but he was able to go get an arrest warrant for Rick and bring him back to Washington. Okay. So when people found out, more people uh, found out Rick was in custody and being charged for the murders, everyone who gave a statement on the day of the murder came out and was like, you got him. It was Rick and Greg. So now that they had one of them in custody, everybody felt comfortable exactly. coming out and saying, oh yeah, I had seen them. So yeah. like the bank teller? The bank teller completely was like, yeah, that was Rick. Oh man. And then some were, other people were like, yeah, that was Greg. Greg was in the back. Were they, um, were their photos part of the lineup? Yes, actually. Greg was. Uh, not not Rick, but Greg's was. Hmm. And it's very unfortunate. Yes. They're known as the Rife brothers, so they yeah. never they never like did things without the other. So everyone yeah. knew it was both of them. Wow. Yeah. But what was actually pretty cool was one of his he had gone to prison for a short amount of time for other mm-hmm. unrelated things. And an ex cellmate actually came forward and mm-hmm. was like, he admitted to me that he committed this murder. Mm-hmm. He did it, but he never disclosed why he did it or if he even had help from his brother. I mean, chances are yes. He never said that to anyone, not even the, the cellmate. He just said, yeah, I murdered them. Hmm. Never was remorseful or anything. Never well, explained that's himself. Surprising. But he was arrested and charged with and found guilty of first degree murder, count one and two, Mm -hmm. first degree kidnapping, count three and four, Mm -hmm. first degree robbery, count five and six, and first degree burglary, count seven. Rick tried to argue that prosecutor committed misconduct by solicitating false testimony due to the ex-cellmate. Mm. testifying for a lesser drug charge or a mm-hmm. plea bargain, but he was denied for the mistrial, and Rick was sentenced to 1,234 months, equaling to 102.9 years. And that's not including the child abuse and rape charges he got charged with in 2014. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, November 2013 was the month and year that he got arrested and he was sentenced for the rest of his life. Is there a possibility for parole? Nope. Oh. Okay. No. No mercy. Well, well, I, I can't say that... I'm sad about that. He, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know until yesterday that he had another charge on him in 2014. I didn't read anything about it besides, obviously, the beginning of it. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Someone came out and was like, yeah, when he got arrested, I came out and was like, he abused me and he raped me when I was 10 years old when he was living with me and my mom. Oh, my God. Yeah. And so I'm sure he got a a longer sentence, but. Oh, my gosh. mm -hmm. Other than that, I couldn't find anything else on him. Ever since before these murders, he was nothing but a criminal in the air. Hmm. But yeah, I hope all of that made sense to your brains. Yes, that all made sense to me. Okay, good. Yes. But yeah, that's it. So it, it took them over 20 years. It took them approximately 20 or 32 years. 32 years to find. To, uh, yeah, to actually get. At least find one of them. Yeah. They were in the cold case episode. They actually like were talking about how they found him in Alaska mm-hmm. in his house. And it was nothing but beer cans, cigarette smoke, and uh, cigarette buds. Mm-hmm. He was actually hooked up to a oxygen machine. Mm-hmm. Like, man was old and dying in his bed. 
That was Rick or or the Rick, other one? Rick. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Because by the time they were questioning them in 2012, mm-hmm. Greg was already passed away. Okay. So, yeah. If you want kind of like a visual of what happened, definitely go watch the episode. Mm-hmm. But if you want more details, I would look at the court document. Okay. Because there are some stuff, and you and I were talking about it earlier, where, like, if someone is like, I don't want to be a part of this, I don't want my name to be a part of it, they kind of just leave it out in yeah. a TV show. Yeah, that's kind of the problem. Uh, not the problem, because everybody has a right to yeah the anonymity. They have a right to that for themselves. But with all of the the true crime documentaries that come out or you know, shows that are coming out, things that are very popular for people to watch now and that yeah. that are coming out. Not everybody wants to be on TV talking about a crime or a no. murder or, you know, kidnapping. Yeah. They're, not everybody, you know, that's their life goal. So it, but in, in having to omit that statement or, or whatever the case may be, they just kind of have to act like the information is just not there at all. Yeah. And and so it does make it difficult when you're kind of like researching. Yeah. Yeah. And but I think that's it this is also a good thing to point out to people who listen to true crime or watch true crime. If the actual court documents or legal documents are not available to get information from, it can be very hard to give accurate information. So mm-hmm. you cannot just trust what you are hearing or reading or seeing on yeah. TV or in a news article. The court documents are going to be the most legitimate yeah. source. That's that's what I was having trouble it. on. Yeah, because yeah. I was thankful that I found the court document. Yeah, and sometimes you can't. I no. There have been a lot of cases where I cannot find them or I can't get access to them in time. And COVID really screwed that up, too, because you used to be able to walk in and make a request. And then it, you know, was like all online. And then they started. Um, you have to like pay for them. You have to pay for them. Or be a part and, of like a subscription thing. And it, um, they don't get things to you quickly. Mm-mm. So there have been, there's actually been a couple of cases where I got the court documents like well after and it didn't really end up changing anything and so I didn't mention it but it's happened a couple of times now where it was well after an episode was released so the court documents are always I think the best yeah to go off of if you can or first person account if you can but yeah it's not always available I would kind of yeah for me I would kind of put like an episode of something as the last resort to go to because yeah. it is such a short amount of time that you're getting to watch one singular episode so they yeah. can only fit so much information but it's still there's a lot of holes in it and I think that's where I struggled the most when I first started writing this episode was I didn't know that there were court documents mm-hmm. so I went strictly off a few articles and the episode Mm -hmm. and I was like none of this is making sense yeah and it wasn't until I got the court documents that I was like oh wait I know what's happening yeah well thanks Olivia you're welcome when's the next one (laughs) (laughs) you did great Lala thanks I'm sweating over here it's all right I (laughs) I was telling Olivia the first time we recorded we were re-recorded a couple of times our first episodes and I I took shots before we recorded because I just the thought of having to it's essentially to speak to all of you exactly to talk to you people. it's it's, it's essentially it's public speaking and it, it scares is. the shit out of yeah, me yeah it, it is and this is the most you guys have heard my voice and I promise I'm not a 12 year old preteen <laughs> I am not <laughs> you did good thanks you I tried good. really hard. It's not easy. It's and, not. And the nature of what we're talking about is not easy to discuss either. So No. Yeah. Especially some, I mean, this is somebody's grandparents. These are people's Oh, yeah. I love them. Family members. They're my grandparents as well now. It's just, it's very hard because who knows what their last moments were. And yeah. Over what? $8,500. Yeah. Exactly. 
<sighs> yeah, it's not worth it. No, and I do feel bad for their family because basically that whole town, because of how much fear that they had over the brothers. Yeah. And like how everyone would just just describe them as grandparents. Like they were everyone's grandparents. Yeah. And that's what I mostly found about like people's opinions of the couple. Yeah. That's very, I don't know. It and also they had a Christmas tree farm. <laughs> Which is like your dream job. Yes. Christmas all year long. Exactly. Mariah Carey. <laughs> I need it. I need that. Mariah Carey and Last Christmas by Wham. Right. I need all of that. Yeah. All year. All year. But your dad says no. <laughs> well, mm. he can have Halloween and Thanksgiving all year. I will have my Christmas. You're not the only one out there, but no, I can't do Christmas. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. there. You know your people. Yes. It's fine. You know your tribe. I'm, I'm alone around here, but in the universe, I am not alone. No, no. All right, everybody. Well, we want to thank you for tuning in. Please just make sure you have good holidays whatever you guys gotta do have happy holidays spend time with your loved ones we are so thankful for you and we appreciate you and remember you guys stay out of the damn woods even the christmas tree farms Mm -hmm. they're not safe no